Hello, this is the Convict Diaries and I'm Denise and I love history and especially the bad boys and girls, the warriors, the criminals and those that didn't conform to the times. It's interesting today how times have changed where once Australia's convict past was seen as a burden today, more often than not if you have an Australian, if you have a convict ancestor, you wear it like a badge of honour because it's a connection with our harsh beginnings. Between 1788 and 1868, about 162,000 convicts were transported to the penal colonies of New South Wales, Van Diemen's Land and Western Australia. It was not until 1938 that the last transported convict, Mr Samuel Speed, died in Western Australia. That was also the year that Australia celebrated 150 years of European settlement. Now we won't dwell on the widely known and accepted early history of Australia, but it definitely deserves to be mentioned. It's commonly known that the Aboriginal Australians were the first to arrive on the continent, arriving by sea around 50,000 to 65,000 years ago, from an area now known as Maritime Southeast Asia, an area which includes Papua New Guinea, they explored and settled throughout the continent. The people of Indonesia often visited Australia's northern coasts. And in the 15th century until the early 17th century, the times were known as the age of exploration. Countries like Spain, Portugal, England, France and the Netherlands explored all parts of the world and began to colonise. The first recorded landing in Australia by a European was in 1606 when the Dutch navigator Willem Jans landed on the western side of Cape York. In October of that year, Spanish explorer Louis Vaz de Torres sailed through and navigated the Torres Strait Islands. At least 29 other Dutch navigators explored the western and southern coasts in the 17th century and they dubbed the continent New Holland. Australian eastern shores were also visited by European explorers but in 1770 Lieutenant James Cook chartered the east coast of Australia for Great Britain. He returned to London with accounts favouring the colonisation of Botany Bay now in Sydney. Some historians have found evidence that sailors from Portugal sailed along parts of the Australian coast many years before Jans or Cook. To put this in some sort of context, let, we've got to look at Britain of the day. Life in Britain was very hard. Industrialisation meant that new machinery had taken jobs, on, jobs of the people on the farms and so they moved to the cities. The result of this was overcrowding, unemployment and poor living conditions. Desperation drove people to steal things to live. Under the harsh laws of the day, the biggest criminals were hung, but for minor crimes such as stealing money or items worth more than a shilling, the sentence was transportation. Previous the British had transported criminals to America. However, due to the American War of Independence, this was no longer an option. Therefore, the prisoners quickly the prisons quickly became full. As a result, prisoners were locked up on board old naval or merchant ships that could still stay afloat. These prison ships were known as hulks and would house up to 300 convicts each. As you can imagine, the conditions on these boats in these floating prisons was absolutely horrible. The surroundings were dirty and cramped and overcrowding illness and disease were a problem. In fact, between 1776 and 1795, nearly 2,000 out of almost 6,000 convicts serving their sentence on board the Hulks died. The majority of these died from diseases such as typhoid. It's here 
that our story kind of begins because it's against this backdrop that John Caesar arrives in Britain. He was more than likely born in Madagascar in around 1763, although nothing is known of his parentage or his early life. It is known that he made his way to England at some point before 1786, more than likely in an attempt to escape plantation slavery. In 1786, he was acknowledged as a servant or labourer living in the parish of St Paul, Deptford, England. On the 13th of March that year at Maidstone, Kent, John was charged with the theft of some £12 from a house and was sentenced to transportation for seven years. John was sent to the Hulk Sears to await transportation. You cannot even begin, or I can't even begin, to imagine the conditions he found himself in. Conditions were overcrowded. They would sleep prisoners in tiered bunks with an average sleeping space of around 5 foot, by 10, inch, 5 foot 10 inches by 18 inches wide. They were assigned to a mess and rations for a week consisted of biscuits and pea soup, single ox cheek and twice a week porridge, a lump of bread and some cheese. They were also allocated to a working gang where they spent 10 or 12 hours a day working on river cleaning projects, stone collecting, timber cutting, embankment and dockyard work while they waited for a transport to take them to the new land. In January 1788, the first fleet of British ships arrived at Botany Bay with a view to the establishment of a penal colony. This was the first European colony on the Australian mainland. They went on to Port Jackson as they found Botany Bay unsuitable. All told, the first fleet comprised of 11 ships and carrying around 1,420 people. This number comprised of 722 convicts. There were also the soldiers who were to guard them, the soldiers' wives, sailors and the ship's officers along with officials for the colony. Conditions were crowded and cramped on the ships, especially for the convicts who were housed for long periods of time behind bars and often chained. For parts of the journey, condition below decks was hot and humid. Diseases such as dysentery and scurvy broke out. When the ships arrived, there was a total of 1,373 people due to some death on the voyage. The convict cargo comprised of 543 male convicts, 189 female convicts and 22 children. Most of the people on board were of English, Scottish, Irish or Welsh origins, but there were also numerous people of other nationalities. That included Africans, Americans, West Indians, Jewish people, at least 14 North Americans, uh, people from Germany, Norway, France, Sweden, Portugal and Holland. John Caesar was aboard the ship the Alexander, the second largest ship in the fleet. The Alexander was built in the hull and it was also and it was 452 tons. The crew strength for the voyage to Australia on the Alexander is not really known, but given the size of the vessel, it's estimated that the crew number would be around 40. The ship also carried around 26 marines to guard the convicts on board. Before the Alexander left the port of Portsmouth, a fever broke out on board and killed 16 men. The Alexander left Portsmouth on the 13th of May 1787, carrying 195 male convicts. Fifteen more convicts died on the journey. This was more than any other ship in the fleet. John White, surgeon aboard HMS Sirius, reported in June 1787 that the cause of the fever was likely inadequate management of the bilge. The ship reached Botany Bay on the 19th of January the next year, which was 1788. The Alexander remained in Sydney until the 14th of July when it sailed back to England. 
John seized and found himself on foreign shores, setting foot off the boat and into the woods. There was plenty of work to be done, clearing the land in order to build the encampment, pitching the tents and unloading the ships. There was noise and confusion. There was noise and confusion, and the conditions were tough. During the day, the prisoners were supervised by a military guard assisted by brutal convict overseers. These were convicts given the task of disciplining their fellow convicts. At night, they would be locked up in small wooden huts behind stockades. At this point, John was more commonly known as Black Caesar. He was a large man and he became known in the colony as a hard worker and a conscientious labourer. But the meagre rations handed out to the convicts meant that he was always hungry. Richard Partridge, one of the settlement's floggers, reported that he was missing some bread from his tent on Tuesday evening, the 29th of April, 1788. He suspected John, though John denied thieving the bread from Partridge. But Partridge felt some bread in John's bag. Caesar claimed that he was given the bread by Mr Sharp. John is mentioned again in the records on the 29th of April 1789 when Black Caesar and Black Jimmy were tried for theft. Jimmy received 500 lashes and Caesar was sentenced to transportation for life. Scott wrote, two black men, convicts, one of them named Caesar and the other called Black Jimmy, was tried by the criminal court for theft. The former transported for life and the latter received 500 lashes. A fortnight later, Caesar bolted. He took some provisions, an iron pot and a soldier's musket stolen from Abraham Hand and took to the bush. Judge advocate David Collins described John as incorrigibly stubborn. However, if he had intended to live off the land, that was soon abandoned because there was no game. He was forced to scavenge around the outskirts of the settlement, thieving what food he could find. He narrowly escaped capture on May the 26th when he had helped himself to some rations from a gang who were making bricks at Brickfield Hill. However, his freedom would be short-lived as he was apprehended on the night of June 6th by a convict named William Saltmarsh while attempting to steal some food from the house of the colony's assistant commissary for stores, Zachariah Clark. Caesar's capture presented Governor Philip with something of a predicament. The governor had to protect the colony's scarce food supply, but he saw significance in Caesar as a labourer. Judge advocate David Collins declared him at the time to be such a wretch and so indifferent about meeting death that he declared while in confinement that if he should be hanged, he would create a laugh before he was turned off by playing off some trick upon the executioner. He also said that holding up such a mere animal as an example was not expected to have the proper or intended effect. The governor therefore, with the humanity that was always conspicuous in his exercise of authority vested in him, directed that he should be sent to Garden Island, there to work in fetters, and in addition to his rations of provisions, he was to be supplied with vegetables from the garden. David Collins described Caesar as having given more trouble than any other convict in the settlement. But despite his behaviour, Collins wrote he, Caesar was incorrigible, incorrigibly stubborn. While his frame was muscular and well calculated for hard labour, but in his intellects he did not very widely differ from a brute. His appetite was ravenous and he could in one day devour the full rations for two days. As time passed, Caesar was allowed to work with H without chains. And as a result, on the 22nd of December, John escaped in a stolen canoe, again taking a gun. He attempted to survive in the bush by stealing food from the gardens of the settlers and threatening settled Aborigines and taking their food. 
However, this effort was fruitless, and on the 31st of January 1790, he returned to the camp, having been speared by some locals. In March, Governor Philip sent the Syrians and supply to Norfolk Island, taking with them nearly a third of the population, including John. David Collins wrote 116 male and 68 female convicts and 27 children were put on board. Among the male convicts, the governor had sent the troublesome and incorrigible Caesar, on whom he had bestowed a pardon. There Caesar gained a measure of independence. By the 1st of July 1791, he was supporting him on a lot at Queenborough and he had been supplied with a hog. Caesar met and had a child with Anne Power, a convict who had arrived on the Lady Juliana in 1790. Mary Ann Power was born on the 4th of March 1792. Anne Power, her mother, passed away in 1796. Caesar returned to Port Jackson on board the Kitty in 1793 leaving Anne and his child behind. Still incorrigible, he took up his former practice of surviving in the woods by plundering the farm and huts on the outskirts of the town. He was soon captured and was still severely flogged. However, according to Collins, he merely declared and with exultation and contempt that all that would not make him better. Caesar was not the only troublemaker in the colony. Of even more concern was the Aborigine Paul May. Paul Moorway. Paul Moorway was born sometime around 1750. He was a proud, bejickle warrior. Please excuse my pronunciation. Warrior man from the Botany area, Botany Bay area of the of the Cooks River and west along the Georges River to Saltpan Creek, south of Bankstown. Pumulwe was shot dead on or about the 1st of June 1802 by Henry Hacking. Pumulwe was leading a guerrilla warfare of resist resistance and late in 1795, Caesar was with a party of Pugni Bay when they were attacked by Pumulwe. Caesar seriously wounded Pumulwe and was proclaimed a hero throughout the colony. Yet once again, John escaped from custody. In December, December 1795, he took to the bush. This would be the last time. He led a gang of absconders and vagabonds in the Port Jackson area, and Governor Hunter warned the settlers against supplying him with ammunition. On the 29th, January 1796, Hunter offered a reward of five gallons of spirits for his capture. On the 15th of February 1796, he was shot by John Wimbo at Liberty Plains, now known as Strathfield, and died after being carried to a hut owned by Thomas Rose. Previous Colin, Collins had noted that rightly or wrongly, every theft that was committed in the area had been attributed to him. There has been a great deal of conjecture about the fate of his daughter, Mary Ann Fisher Power, also known as Poor. She was born on the 3rd of March, 1792, on Norfolk Island. Both of her parents had died in 1796 and it appears that she was probably adopted by Mary Randall, who arrived on board the ship the Lady Juliana in the Second Fleet, her, and her common-law husband, William Fisher, A.K. Blatherhorn, who arrived on the ship Charlotte on the First Fleet. By most accounts, she spent her entire childhood and teenage years on Norfolk Island, being one of the last to leave the first settlement there in 1813. Mary Ann apparently had two children, Rebecca, born in, 18, in 1807, and Sarah, born about 1809. There is a possibility that John Piper, public servant, landowner and military officer, was the father of Rebecca. 
In 1813, she was Anne Poor, aged 23, in the list of people who bought the Lady Nelson at Norfolk Island. Sailing to Port Dalrymple, Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania. William Fisher, alias William Blatterhorn, and his wife, Mary Randall, were also in the passenger list. It appears that Anne left her husband, George Greenway, though it was probably her common-law husband, on the 17th of May 1824 at Port Macquarie because there is a marriage between Anne Paul Free to Joseph Connor, prisoner, per ship Sally, September 1821. Interestingly, one of the witnesses was Rebecca Piper. She probably passed away on the 10th of January 1825 as Anne Connor, aged 32, Free at Port Macquarie. Thank you so much for joining me on today's little journey. This is my first attempt, so please take it easy on me. If you enjoyed any of this, today's content, please like, subscribe, etc. And join me again when I'll bring you a new episode in the new entry in the Convict Diaries. Okay, bye.